welcome. We have a very distinguished speaker, and we're all very much looking forward to his presentation, uh, Dr. Christoph Fry. But before um, he addresses you, I'm going to ask uh, Paul Mulvaney from the ESB, and we want to say again, I want to say again to, rec to record our gratitude, uh, thanks um, to the ESB for their generous support and sponsorship for this event and for uh, another lecture, another talk we had some weeks back. Um, your support is always uh, very important to us and uh, we want to mark that again uh, and reflect that by asking Paul just to address you just for a few minutes. Paul Mulvaney. On behalf of ESB, I'd like to uh, welcome you all here today. Uh, we're co-hosting this, this lecture with the IIEA. It's the uh, second of two keynote uh, lectures we're having in advance of a conference called Take Charge that's happening on the 23rd of November in the, in the Mansion House in the Round Room. So last month, uh, Dr. Anna Mengelini gave a very good lecture around the social aspects of a smart grid. And today, uh, Dr. Fry, he, who's Secretary of the World Energy Council, is going to look at three different scenarios uh, for the future of the global energy sector out in 2060 or out until 2060. So the, these scenarios are based on insights that he's gained over the last number of years. Uh, working in the World Energy Council and for members of, the, of that council. And he's just told us how uh, frequently he tra travels around the world, 85 different countries he's been in. So he's uh, definitely got a great kind of base on which to base these theories. I suppose they're really all founded around the energy trilemma, uh, which, which is looking at energy equity, which is really access, I suppose, to, to energy, uh, the environment, and then energy security. So that kind of trilemma is something that we're very familiar with in ESB. It's something that we deal with every day. And our real focus is on leading a transition to a low carbon future while having affordable and secure electricity for everybody. So my own area in ESB, I'm an executive director of innovation, so I lead a unit that's looking at all of these new technologies, uh, looking at customer needs in the future, looking at all of, of, all of the elements of that trilemma and trying to bring sustainable low carbon uh, electricity into society and for people to use that electricity, particularly around the electrification of heat and transportation. They're really key elements and they're really the only ways that Ireland is going to be able to meet its emissions targets is to decarbonize electricity and then electrify heat and transport. So we're looking at say, all of those different areas, uh, new technologies, digital storage, etc., in that space. So um, for Ireland, uh, this is obviously a big issue, uh, and we have limited resources, I suppose, and uh, looking at the national debt and the potential penalties that our Ireland faces uh, if we don't meet our emissions targets makes this a really kind of pertinent and, and very urgent issue for us in the country. In 2016, Ireland was ranked 20 out of 125 countries around this world energy trilemma. So that's an acknowledgement, I suppose, that we are kind of getting to grips with it, but there's an awful lot left to do. Uh, just this year, uh, for ESB, it's a proud year for us. It's our 90th anniversary this year, so it's 90 years since we opened the uh, hydroelectric power station down in Ardna Crusha. Uh, so we've been in this game for a long time and I suppose we started with 100% renewable electricity and we've been on a journey and now we're coming back again. And uh, so, But it is, it is a transition and it is a journey and it, it can't just happen overnight and everybody expects their lights to come on every time they flick the switch but they want it to be greener and greener all the time and affordable all the time. So I think this will be at the heart of, of uh, what Christopher is going to speak about today. So just in, in terms of uh, our speaker, so Dr. Fry is Secretary General of the World Energy Council. That's a nat national network of leaders and practitioners um, promoting an affordable, uh, stable and environmentally sensitive electricity system for the benefit of all. So since joining the Council in 2009, his priorities have been to mobilise international energy leaders and decision makers to work together towards building this sustainable energy future. I suppose a lot of the work is around um, policy making and the sporting the right kind of policies. So he's recently joined the board of the energy blockchain focused Energy Web Foundation, which we, we had a bit of a, a chat about at, at dinner. And my own belief is blockchain is, is going to be a huge disruptor in the energy industry. And it's really going to give a lot of, it, it, it really accommodate peer to peer trading, I think, which will really kind of uh, socialize energy and democratize energy and will make, in some cases, the utilities less relevant. But I think that's, that's, that's just a natural evolution of the way things are going to go on. 
So before joining the World Energy Council, Dr. Fry was Senior Director of at Energy Industries and Policies at the World Economic Forum and a member of the World Economics Forum Executive Council from 2001 to 2009. Previously he held various positions as Research Fellow and Lecturer at Swiss Federal uh, Technical Institute in Zurich and Lausanne and uh, Verlingen. So Dr. Fry's work and publications have covered energy scenarios, climate and labour market policy, energy water nexus and the future of utilities. Uh, his main focus has been to provide world decision makers with the necessary evidence uh, base for high level dialogue um, and really are supposed to address this energy dilemma or trilemma. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, what an honor to speak in such a, a privileged place. Um, what I'd like to do uh, in the next half hour or so is give you a sense of what we mean by the World Energy Council, uh, active in 100 countries, what we mean by the grand transition, grand energy transition. And I, I think um, uh, some of the questions that I just want to throw in, I hope I will feed uh, some elements that help you better or, or uh, consider them in a different way. One of, the, one of the issues that I just want to throw in up front, if we are talking about things like blockchain or renewables, etc., first instinct is democratization. Does this mean less or more geopolitics? It's probably one, one, one thing to um, just um, you know, to put your mind around. As, uh, another thing is obviously we, we speak about, we come from an industry where 50% of capital worldwide is sunk in energy and energy close infrastructure. Can you turn this around? Is leapfrogging possible in that area? You know, is that kind of, is massive change possible? Is another, uh, another question uh, uh, one can ask. And, and obviously, how do you handle innovation in a place that is so, you know, so it is such a big steamer? How do you handle innovation? What happens if you don't? And so those are a few of the things, typical questions we get from, uh, from our stakeholder, be that policy stakeholder or, or, or sector stakeholders. And we, we, we develop our scenarios and our thinking to help support. We can't give the answers, but we help certainly support um, the signals capturing. We have an amazing um, access to signals in 100 countries. Um, uh, 3,000 organizations are our members and, and, and help us with signals. Um, and we then obviously hope to work with many of you um, uh, on innovation, on policy strategies etc. Now first what I'd like to do is just briefly present um, what we mean by our three scenarios and I, um, I'm gonna uh, you know ju just that you have an intuitive way to play yourself uh, uh, you know with, with the word that the wording that we are using. We have three scenarios and when we say scenarios it's clearly not road mapping it's not forecasting. Scenarios are there if you're in the business if you're in policy making um, uh, we, we try and, and, and s open up the future in what is the plausible space of futures that we can imagine based on the signals we see today. And then within, those, um, within this um, uh, funnel, um, uh, for you to then consider you know, your strategies, be they policy or stra um, uh, business strategies, are you going to survive? Are you going to strive in those kind of in, in, in this space? And if not, how do you have to rethink? That's really the, the objective of scenarios. And we have spanned out the space of plausible future with those three scenarios. The first one is what we call a jazz scenario. Jazz, um, jazz is defined by rhythm. Uh, rhythm is obviously the, the fundamental thing of jazz. And what we refer to as ry rhythm here is effective market mechanisms, not only national, but also international effective market me mechanisms, so that the uh, best instrument, the best technology, can play its solo in a wonderful way. Uh, um, so th this jazz world is all about bringing it to the consumer cheap and now. That's what the jazz world is characterized. So effective market me uh, me uh, mechanism with the consumer who wants it cheap and now at the forefront of decision making. The second world is, is, is different. The, dif the difference, the main difference is you have a director. You have a, uh, the unfinished uh, symphony has a director, somebody who is in charge, who actually has a public good interest in his mind, climate change, and says, I know kind of how to get there. Markets, I don't fully trust the markets. I know which technology will help us get there. So I'm going to pick and choose some techno technologies, think of e-mobility, despite them being slightly more expensive, but I'm, I know they will be better, etc., and therefore I'm going to beat the market by choosing them. So Symphony has this public good interest and kind of this visionary uh, character of a policymaker, 
but we may not always end up with the cheapest solution. That's probably the, um, uh, the, the unfinished symphony uh, world. Um, key to that world is obviously carbon agreement. Carbon agreement, COP, um, uh, the Paris post-Paris follow-up is absolutely essential uh, to the unfinished symphony. Then the third is the hard rock scenario. And to describe this one, let me go back to the other two. The first scenario, what we, we describe as, as a jazz, the rhythm, we all know market frameworks do not fall from sky, um, neither nationally nor internationally. If we, if we do not put muscle in there, there we, you know, all, uh, trade barriers build up almost by themselves. Huh? Um, uh, kind of the, the, the stopping markets from being effective, that almost builds up. So you have to put muscle in there to have effective technology, to, to be able to uh, change, to trade the most effective technology it takes muscle. Think of si Chinese solar cells. Huh? How easy is it to build up a trade barrier to not let them in, uh, as an example? Now, it takes equally muscle to build up um, a carbon framework. We all know how hard that is. Now, the third scenario is one where we do neither put muscle into the trade nor in the carbon, um, into the carbon framework. So it's an inward focused more kind of nationalistic, fragmented um, uh, world where we uh, emphasize own resources, including coal. Many countries have own resources coal. It can be renewable as well. But we will not get to the cheapest technology because we have uh, trade barriers, local content requirements, etc. And that is the third scenario that we are describing. I'm going to just leave those hang, you know, you know, in the room for, for, for a moment and, and lead you through what we mean by grand transition, but at the end come back what actually in the grand transition, what it means um, uh, in terms of, of, of those scenarios. Now, grand transition, I'm going to describe the grand transition uh, with, th with really four pieces. First, a contextual one, and then three pieces that are th three fundamental driving forces within uh, the industry. First, context. Context, and I'm going to always look back 45 years and then look forward uh, 45 years and compare what is different. Um, 45 years back, we have doubled world population um, over the past 45 years. Over the next 45 years, we are only going to add in the mid scenario, that's by the UN, um, uh, that's not our scenario, it's the UN, is plus 40%. So we lose 60% of population growth. Why is that important? Over the last 45 years, it obviously links back to GDP. How? Over the past 45 years, we have multiplied global GDP by a factor 4.4. That translates into an annual growth rate of 3.5% per year. Half of that, 1.7%, comes from, came from labor market growth. 1.7%, if you take out 60% of 1.7, you take out 1% out of 3.5% uh, average growth. That means, basically, that losing 60% of um, population growth comes down to losing 1% of GDP growth unless we catch up on the productivity side. And we all know that's not a given. So there is a risk that we lose on the growth uh, side simply because we slow down uh, population growth. And that in a context where we have accelerated decoupling energy from GDP, we have, on average, we have multiplied uh, energy with a factor 2.6 2 over the past 45 years. That means annual average 1.1% um, 1, uh, decoupling of energy from GDP. We last year published with the UN Sustainable Energy for All that uh, decoupling was 2.6%. So, two point, excuse me, 2.1% with the 2.6% being the objective. That means we have accelerated the decoupling of energy from GDP. Now, why am I losing so much? Why am I disturbing you with so much, many numbers? To make the point, the, take those three together, the, together, slowing down population, possible slowing down GDP with an accelerating decoupling from, uh, of energy from GDP, we end up in the question, well, when are, is demand going to peak? Demand, not supply. And that is a first contextual big difference 
um, going forward than uh, in, in comparison where we are coming from. Now, adds to that, well, we all know uh, demand is moving from um, west to east. You know, China is going to be the biggest economy uh, by 2030. India is going to um, beat um, in terms of population um, China by, in the, in the, uh, by 2030. Some say already today has happened, depending on which uh, statistics you um, uh, consider. Africa is the fastest growing in terms of population uh, growth continent. Um, and uh, we know that institutions are changing. Post-World War I institutions were strong or relatively strong. And we, uh, with what we have seen, they haven't really got... Um, you know, WTO, it's a long time since they have their had their last success moment, etc. The same is true. UN is struggling in a number of areas. Um, so institutions are they really going to play a stronger uh, role in the next 45 years. I have to stop here, but just shortly, the key point is population growth is different. The Demand centers are different. Uh, the regional, uh, the global governance uh, context may be um, uh, weakened. That's a different context going forward than looking backwards. First point. Now let me go into the into the um, three driving forces. I'm going to start with the decarbonization is the first driving force. I'm going to quickly give the three driving forces, but then dive into each of them. Decarbonization. Innovation, independently from decarbonization. And the third one is resilience, also an innovation driver. So all of those three innovate drive innovation, but I would say um, let's start with uh, the, the decarbonization first. Over the past 45 years, we have decarbonized on average with 1% per year. In order to achieve the two degrees Celsius objectives, we have to accelerate to 6% per year decarbonization of GDP. And I can already see a few, uh, few faces going, wow, that's never going to happen. Well, if it's not going to happen, we have a problem. And that is obviously the issue here. It's not evolution. We're talking about revolution here. Huh? This is big. This is not small. Let me give you another number um, to illustrate that. Let's look at, for, at our carbon budget. What does carbon budget mean? It means how much CO2 are we allowed to emit to not exceed the two degrees Celsius limit, a thousand gigatons. A thousand gigatons we are allowed to emit do not exceed. Now, let's add up all the um, uh, known resources, coal, oil, gas, and see how much we actually have in terms of known resources today. It's 2,800 gigatons of equivalent CO2. 2,800 we are allowed to emit only 1,000 gigatons, so we have a factor 2.8 more in known resources that we are, than we are allowed to, um, uh, to, to burn and emit. Now, okay, there is CCS, carbon capture and storage, to put away the CO2, dream on, you know, dream on, let's dream off again. It's not going to happen to the extent we would need it. Um, we do not see the signals for CCS to deliver a substantive part today into that gap. Clearly not. So the, the choice is twofold. Either we burn more than we can and we heat up, or, you know, we don't burn it. And what is that? It's stranded resources. Now, let's come back to the question I've asked in the beginning, you know, the geopolitics, etc. question. Not burning resources that we know today is not going to be easy, at least not for those countries who have already, you know, thought they can sell that. Stranded resources, and we have spoken about the factor 2.8, is a massive geopolitical driver, obviously. Um, you know, you can imagine what it means. We can have a long discussion about what it means for future oil prices and mechan mechanics uh, underneath that. But the long story short, clearly there is geopolitics behind that issue. If we have stranded resources, we have to work on the regional and global politics to handle that. Very important. I think I leave it with that for the, for the carbon story. So it's from 1% to 6% not evolution, but revolution, and the fact that 2.8 more resources than we have than what we can burn. Let's go to the second innovation, uh, the, the uh, innovation independent even from the decarbonization. I'm going to mention three keywords here. First is electrification of final demand. We, with our scenario, see independently of the scenario, roughly a doubling of electricity um, um, uh, supplying final demand uh, needs 
uh, between now and the next, within the next 45 years, independently of the scenarios, roughly a doubling. So we are going to, and that's true, is it e-mobility? We, we are, you know, f f electrification of final demand everywhere. Is that heat? Um, you think of the heat pump. Is that, the, um, is that even in industrial production, steel? We are talking about steel through electricity then, uh, rather than coal, etc. You look, you want to you, you go check out where you want to see electrification um, efforts. So if you have a combination of electrification, electricity is the new oil, and look what happens behind with decentralization and digitalization, obviously the renewable side uh, being co-driver of that, um, then, you know, what is the space of innovation here? It's big. Now, let me quickly show our issue survey. This is unpublished. It's not yet the full response, but it's reasonably robust already for this year. And what it shows is, yeah, I've explained over lunch. We have, we give, no, no cheating allowed, we give you 40 cluster terms and 40 themes, only 40 with which you can summarize energy. Think what those themes are. They include things like um, climate change, um, they include things like um, digitalization, like cybersecurity, like um, obviously the, the regional policy aspects, market aspects, etc. And then we go out with those 40 terms every year to, um, to our constituents worldwide and ask them, tell us about impact, uncertainty and time frame. Are those the keep me awake at night issues? Are, are those the issues that keep you busy at work, etc.? And we get an agenda every single year. Now here's what this agenda uh, tells. If you look over the past five years, look at, you know, first, we, we are coming from a sector that doesn't really move, right? 50% of global capital investment can't move that rapidly. But look how CEOs and ministers, 1,390 countries, have responded over the past uh, um, five years. Those are digitalization, electric storage, market design, decentralized system renewables. Coming from back uh, bank type of issue to the forefront and center type of issues. I think this in itself should tell a story about the energy transition. Let's quickly dive into the digitalization. We have done a deep dive in digitalization in four areas. We looked at Internet of Things and blockchain as one area. We looked at the whole big data um, uh, predictive supply chain management, etc., as a second uh, type of area. We looked at the mobile cloud financing mechanism type of area, and we looked at general platform, business model type of areas. And you see that those issues, all of them, A, have gone, uh, the, the whole digitization have come up, and Internet of Things is probably the number one critical uncertainty for energy leaders globally today. Now, I'm just throwing those things at you, and you probably are a little puzzled, you know, hell, what is that going to do to us? And, uh, I'm going to dive in um, uh, in a bit uh, greater depth. The short story is those things, again, three or four years ago, five years ago, were not on the agenda. And today, you know, who is not busy with them? Let me give you just a, th a few examples of what we see in different countries on the top of the innovation agenda. I've been in Chile a couple of weeks back, and this year's auction in Chile, they beat, they, they have competition with the um, uh, Moroccan and the Emirati on the lowest solar uh, price. This year's pr auction price in Chile was $29 per megawatt hour. However, they already say for next year it's going to be $20 for megawatt hour. So another crash by a third of the price within 18 months, basically, they expect. It's not been done yet, but that's everybody I've spoken to, a number of the say they are preparing for the $20 um, dollar per, uh, That's one example. Let's look blockchain. We have seen first pilots. Why? Who is familiar with blockchain? Who, are, who, who has already, within business activity or policy activity, actively dealt with blockchain? Hand up. It's a minority. It's obviously a minority. I'm not surprised. Now, let me quickly make an intuitive case of blockchain. And then this is just an illustration of one pilot. There is, um, you know, there is hundreds of pilots out there. There is dozens of startups. All, almost daily an energy blockchain startup is, is being built. By the way, a good to policy uh, makers, you know, it's... Uh, you don't build a, a blockchain startup anywhere. You only build it where the regulation allows it to do it, bracket closed. So worthwhile spending some time on that as policymakers. I said that you know, in Switzerland as well, very happy. A lot of startups are in Switzerland. I, I don't claim anything there, but we have, first, what is blockchain? Everybody's talking about storage. Now the question, one question we can ask 
should we in, do we need physical storage or are there possibly other things that we could leverage here? Okay, let me give you one example. Everybody has a fridge, right? Now your fridge has probably, it's 100 watt, right? it takes 100 watt to, um, uh, to operate your fridge, and your fridge, you're probably happy if your fridge is within you know, plus minus two degrees. Huh? Plus minus two degrees, um, you, know, you don't really care if, it's, uh, you know, if it remains that range. If you give away, like you know, in an Uberized world, you give away the management of, those, um, you know, of, of this temperature difference, in such a way that somebody can switch off your fridge when the electricity demand is high and switch it on when it's uh, low. You know, that, and you know, do that for one fridge, it doesn't make a difference. Do that for a million fr a fridge of 100 watt, that's actually 100 megawatt. And you don't do it for 100 fridge, um, uh, only you do it for the heaters, water heaters, you include the storage of, of your car, you etc., 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 and suddenly you have gigawatt for a, for a million people, you have suddenly kind of gigawatt hours of um, virtual storage in your system. How can you harvest that? Blockchain is one of those technologies that actually can give you a possibility to harvest that type of sector coupled. Um, storage that is already there that nobody has to spend money for except obviously for the enabling. Now I'm going to leave the blockchain, we can have a long discussion about blockchain, but just as, a, as, a, as an example, blockchain is nothing else as enabling, you know, much more interaction, controlled interaction in the system in such a way that we can leverage the system into a much deeper way. Now, quick word on e-mobility. You know, we have obviously heard that France and the UK have said um, out of diesel and gasoline by 2040. And if I, I, I'm not going to take a survey now. Um, uh, who believes, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put any, any, anybody on the wall, but I've done it in other places and the, the answer was quite clear. So who's going to believe, who's going to trust the government? And usually the answer is kind of mm, only halfway, um, if at all. However, Let's quickly go a step further. Now, China, we have heard, is it six weeks ago, the, the vice minister of um, industry and um, information technology in China has, has said, well, actually, we are looking at this as well. We are looking at exiting um, diesel and gasoline. Now, if we are half-hearted, convinced that uh, France and UK, and by the German government, uh, uh, the German parliament has also started discussing it, but if if you are hesitating to believe it's going to happen there, let's quickly think through China. China has no conventional industry in the motor uh, manufacturing. Huh? So whereas Germany, France, UK can lose a lot of employment here, China can't really. But it could possibly have a competitive position in e-mobility. It already today produces, BYD as a standalone Chinese company produces more electric cars than Tesla today already. It has the objective to take out pollution out of cities, more so than the climate objective, but that is obviously something electric vehicles can uh, do. It has all kind of other industrial kind of um, opportunity. Think of the, the re it, it goes hand in hand with the renewable strategy that the, uh, China has. China has a number of exactly the right drivers and motivations to say this is actually not just a, a policy, a nice to have objective, it's actually a competitive um, advantage or objective. So I would personally expect that China is going to announce something at least as aggressive than, than we have heard from, from France and UK. And, you know, I, 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 I'm actually looking, monitoring media for that. Now, what if China does it? And we are within our scenario saying transport is the most difficult sector to transition because of the employment issue, because of the um, uh, pers uh, personal consumer choice issue, etc. But if China does it, then Germany and all the others who have their biggest market in China have to run very quickly to not miss a train. What does it mean for France and the UK? My question in the, uh, just before that. So suddenly sounds much more serious, right? And, well, that's China, Europe, other Asian may follow, North America not as clear, Canada may be interested, they have already e-mobility quite substantial efforts today, I think the rest of North America to be seen, uh, etc. Latin America starts, uh, likes a lot biofuels, but they flirt also with the e-mobility, so suddenly you can have a dramatic you know, leverage of change. If China does this, you know, the transport will, will look different. 
And again, what does this do to peak oil? Not peak supply, peak demand. The biggest consumer of oil is transport. So here's a, um, let me take another innovation example. And it's, um, uh, so, so we had the blockchains, we had the solar, um, we had the transport question, we have the rural, one of the biggest rural access, electricity access, one of the biggest challenges, we have 1.1 billion people without access to electricity. It's, the number is going down, great news, but it's harder to get it down in the rural space. 86% of 1.1 billion are in rural areas. And, you know, you know, the question is probably rural, what does it mean? It's not 10 kilometers away from the next uh, infrastructure hub. It's 100 kilometers or more away from that next um, infrastructure hub for most of those people. So how do you, can you leapfrog in any way? Can you leapfrog in energy? No way, right? Now, what has happened over the past, and this is also five years or so, you have a number of startups who do the incredible. They actually deliver to this family. This family lives from two to three dollars per day. Two to three dollars. Now, two to three dollars, 80 cents of which is used for kerosene for the lamp huh? uh, and other similar kind of uh, uh, energy needs. 80 cents of two to three dollars going to kind of, uh, you know, that's quite, it's a lot of money. Huh? Now, what this family suddenly has here, you can see a television, a radio, a cell phone charging, which by the way, I can charge the, the cell phone of the neighbor and make some money from, a lamp. There's a solar cell that you cannot see up there. The battery is here as well. And there's somewhere in the, in the there's even an iron, an iron to do the ironing because the the, the smart um, entrepreneurs have seen that one of the first other than those electronic uh, devices was actually an iron. Interesting. Now, how much do you think that system costs? It's all high. You cannot buy pieces individually. You buy, buy it as a package. It costs. $300, everything together. Highly optimized DC, high efficiency um, components. $300, can you buy that as a two to three dollar household? No way. Can you lease it? Well, let's quickly think through. 40 cents a day. If the internal rate of return is very small, which those entrepreneurs, they look at 0.01% internal rate of return or similar. 40 cents a day makes you own that system after two to three years. Good deal, right? So suddenly when you can ship those Amazon, it comes down to shipping the plug and play Amazon boxes out to those households, which is, sounds suddenly like leapfrogging in a similar way as we have seen without need for central infrastructure. The only thing you, it takes is actually bringing those boxes to the households. Now, but, and obviously the payment comes with the cell phone. Cell phones are there already. Everybody has a cell phone. Now, the, the question is, what does this do innovation-wise? Obviously, it brings, you know, there's a 1.1 billion customer base, potentially. You know, think of the storage and solar cell, probably there, you know, let's not even focus on that. The smart meter, there's a smart meter in there. A smart meter that actually, through broadband, brings back the, you know, the signals of consumption, et cetera, to, to the owner. That smart meter cannot cost $150 as yours. It costs $2. Huh? Think about the learning curve again. So learning curves, I'm going to quickly jump. I have the sign for, we're getting the end, but I come to the third um, uh, driver. First driver, decarbonization. Second driver, innovation. Think of all those areas that are moving all at the same time. And the third driver is really, you have seen it here as well. We had a, a hurricane recently. Is the extreme weather events, energy water nexus, cyber. So new physical and virtual risks that hit us in a different way than in the past. I'm just going to give, for the sake of time, one example. This is the number of events, extreme weather events, over the past 45 years. Factor four up. Does this look like ceiling? It doesn't look like ceiling to me. So if it's still going to go up, let's quickly think what that means. 45 years back, you were asked to build something that should be resilient, a term that was not perhaps used in the same way back then. But, you know, did you plan for the margin it took? to survive a factor four in extreme weather events? Well, if you did, you were certainly fired. Huh? <laughs> you were certainly fired. Now, let, let's quickly fast forward. Today, there's no ceiling there. Are you planning for the factor four over the next 45 years for something now? Well, if you are, you're fired. Huh? As simple as that, that's the reality today. So how do you handle this factor four in a good way? And we have started collecting many 
many case studies um, of how people actually do the things, and it's, it, it starts from public procurement over um, designing the, uh, things in a different way. The shortest story I can give is the following. La Fontaine has actually described it to us. He said, we built, you know, if you're building uh, uh, oaks, and we have built oaks in the energy system, if you're building oaks, if they go down, well, they stay down. They stay down. You build them stronger so they can't go down. Well, factor four stronger you cannot afford to do, right? But if you build the reed, if you build them like reed, you know, yes, they go down too. Reed is going down too, but it stands up by itself after a storm because it's locally empowered, may have black starting capability. It has possibly even local financing solutions that do not need to go through, through uh, long winded public procurement processes um, when bringing th things back, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this reed solution is part of the resilient thinking in, in rethinking the system in such a way that it actually, yes, it's going to go down but it, has, it will be coming up uh, more rapidly again. So this is, in short, when we speak about the grand transition, different context, three drivers, decarbonization from 1% to 6%, not evolution, but revolution, the factor 2.8 in um, uh, more emissions. We have seen the innovation, electrification, supported by decentralization, digitalization. We have seen the space of, of innovation areas. And then on the resilience side, the whole question about from, um, from uh, the oak to the reed, the, from hard resilience to soft resilience, how you, how you do that. Now, I've promised to close by simply bringing it back to the, the scenarios, if I may, if I have enough time to do that. Um, uh, we, when we judge the scenarios, and I cannot, I'm not even going to lead through the results, but perhaps just one, we see things like peak oil, not peak supply, peak demand in the 30s. Coal essentially has peaked now, except for the hard rock scenario. Gas, we don't see peak before the mid-century because it helps bridge um, for now. But as of the mid, mid of century, it's really uncertain even for gas. And, you know, if you look quickly at the scenarios and we judge them by our trilemma, the trilemma that was mentioned uh, um, in the beginning, the trilemma is basically our judgment. We are saying if we have a good balance between energy security, the energy equity, so affordability and access, and the environment, the climate and local pollution side, if we have those three in good balance, because sometimes, not always, they compete, and wherever they compete, we need to keep them in balance. We cannot afford to neglect one because that means a new government will be elected and the next government will do, it every, will do everything different. And we know what that is called. That has a name. It's policy risk and all the investors will run away if we have it. So it doesn't help the transition. So therefore, we are saying to keep those three at all times in balance is the best objective we can have in energy policy. Now, let's quickly see how well uh, the scenario is performing. That. First, gas. You know, reasonably well balanced, reasonably well balanced, and actually big, so relatively good performance, best performer in energy access. Sounds logical because we, we said, you know, bring it to the consumer cheap and now, and, and uh, the rural entrepreneurship model that you have seen with 0.01% of internal rate of, uh, of return. Just guess what it does if, a, if some, a, a government locally decides to add a little bit of admin hurdle or a local content requirement or an import duty, the, the business model is dead. It's not going to happen. So in jazz, those barriers are not building up and therefore deliver best um, to, the, to the rural poor. Now, symphony, um, the unfinished symphony delivers best in terms of the climate agreement but we unfinished symphony because even with, uh, with our latest scenario, we are not yet seeing even with unfinished symphony to get the um, two degree climate objective. Bracket open, every time we redo our uh, scenarios, we're getting a step closer and I'm a technology optimist. The reason why we are every, uh, um, every time a uh, step closer is because innovation is just faster than what we can imagine. And uh, we, we are not able to imagine the speed of Im imagination. That's the reason why we, we are always beaten by the reality coming around. So I would actually say that symphony is the closest and it's getting probably closer than what we are saying today. But it's more expensive and more expensive means that the, the, the most um, uh, deprived, they have the toughest job to, still, to A, pay for, uh, for uh, electricity, energy, and have access to more expensive solutions. Now, let's look at hard rock. Hard rock is the one we really do not like, and I think it's a key message. Hard rock, so not doing the trade that allows getting the best technology cheaply to wherever it has to go. 
doesn't do us a service. Not doing the climate agreement and not doing both of those is clearly the worst outcome because it makes everything more expensive, more dirty and less secure. Why? Well, the simple story is if you have local content, that's great. It's great to have local content, but if, if it makes your technology more expensive, less people can afford it in the Cindy Austin. If you impose local technology and local resources as well, that's great as well, but it may actually be more dirty and we cannot afford more dirty in a climate context. And therefore, the more dirty, more expensive, and why the less secure? Well, less secure, again, first of all, if you, if, you shot, if you don't trust your neighbor, you have to do it yourself, and that may not always be the most secure solution. But think also of a, of a post-Brexit, um, um, if, if, if uh, the UK has to build up its own um, uh, uh, nuclear safety agencies, that really a step into greater safety. I'm not saying it's the opposite, but it certainly doesn't help um, the communication, et cetera, uh, and, and harmonization efforts. So for all of those reasons, at we are saying hard rock is the one future we do not like. I'm going to conclude. I think I've, I've said in the beginning, look at things like is, um, and, and perhaps there are some answers, how, you know, what does it mean, um, the grand transition in terms of um, is energy getting more political, less political? I think with the, with the stranded resources, while we are talking about democratization of energy, let's not fool ourselves. It's going to be much harder uh, policy context, geopolitical, etc., and we have to be ready to, um, uh, to handle that. I, I, I've said, you know, the innovation side, there's so much, obviously, uh, that, that is going on. I think that the shortest message we can give is, well, innovation is actually exciting. If you're not doing it, uh, if you're not taking care of it, you can be sure somebody else will. Thank you very much. Thank you.